morning, everybody. Welcome to our November Lake and Wildlife Partners meeting. Uh, my name is Megan Wandry. I'm a fellow Lake and Wildlife Partner. Our fearless leader, Dara Sinclair, is away at a wedding in New York, so I'm left in charge to facilitate, so I think everything will go just fine as long as you don't have questions about things like um, lakes or uh, wildlife. <laughs> So if you guys can promise that you won't do that to me, this should go just fine. Artie, for our board report. Well, happy, beautiful November. It's been great. Uh, your board has been uh, really busy in October. We did three things. Budget, budget, budget. We had three meetings, uh, open to everyone, uh, a lot of participation, particularly from the, the new board members and we got a lot accomplished. Um, this last Tuesday, before the meeting started for, on the budget, we actually had a formal board meeting. We approved a budget amendment so that we can replace the roof on the tavern and the pro shop, and that should happen uh, pretty soon. The other thing we approved was the purchase of a fire truck for public safety. That's a big deal. Uh, that, that'll be here sometime in January. The, um, the GM search is going well. Uh, the four search committee members uh, have been very busy. I uh, have no idea when we'll have a, a new GM, but uh, they're, they're working it. Next Tuesday, <clears throat> we're having a board work session. You can see the agenda on Friday news. We're going to try to get through that as quick as possible because the biggest uh, thing we're going to talk about is the budget because the following Tuesday we'll approve the budget at the last official board meeting. Uh, Tuesday, you're welcome, please come. It's at 6.30 p.m. in the evening. The, the gearbox, if you've been across the dam, you've seen this great, big, beautiful thing, very colorful. Um, it's installed. I think it works. Uh, the underwater construction company is building the trash rack that will go over the sluice gate at, at the bottom of the lake. Um, we're trying to schedule when they're going to be here to complete that. And when they do, they're going to open the sluice gate. Well, I said that with a lot of confidence. Yeah. We don't know that it's going to work, but we're, we feel pretty good about, about it happening. I uh, saved the uh, best for last. Um, in the budget, Lake and Wildlife requested some money to turn the lake into a fishery. Um, it's still in there, um, and I believe it, it, it'll pass, so well, that looks really good. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Artie. So since we last met in October, we want to tell you a little bit about what we've done. We had another very successful Tamarack Treasure Sale. That was our holiday sale edition, I think. Once expenses are in, we're still just over $8,000 that we brought in, which is just incredible. So an uh, outstanding group of volunteers that have worked really, really hard. So that's two very successful sales that are the bulk of our fundraising, and uh, it couldn't have gone better. So thank you for all that helped us there. Uh, we had an employee luncheon that we do every single year, run by Luann Chambers, and that went off without a hitch. But all of our employees had uh, plenty of food and things. She'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the KBTB fall planting that took place, um, Andy couldn't be here, but wanted to run down what they accomplished on that day. There were nine sunshine anisas planted at the Mail Center, 45 flats of pansies planted at the Cove Road entrance, administration, tavern flower boxes, and the back gate, the herb garden renovation and installation of new plants and herbs, and autumn ferns planted at the entrance to the courts. So there was some mulch also installed at the entrance and the back gate. So very successful, lots of hard work, and it just looks beautiful if you haven't seen it. So I already, already mentioned the fishery improvement uh, proposal to the board, so we hope for some good news there. There's a lot of work put in there. Huff couldn't be here to give us an update, but hopefully he will be here in December to give us an update once the board makes their decision on how we're going to move forward. Um, fishing guidelines were updated. If you guys saw those in the bench, in the Friday news yesterday, very important. Again, as we work to 
you know, populate the lake with the fish that we need. It's important that we kind of tamper down on the fishing that can be done. So if you guys didn't have a chance to see that, some some uh, things of note that, you know, two fish per person, we're talking about bass and catfish, four per boat, um, crappie, 15 per person. Uh, you can't fish with minnows anymore. And then the bluegill and the bream, catch and release only. It's very important to our, our plan to keep those in there. So you can catch them, but don't take them home. Um, trail info updated for the, the VTCI directory. Danny Day's working really hard on that. I'm sure you're getting his emails, so it's, that's good. The point set of sale is going through November 10th, so make sure you guys put your orders in. I unfortunately don't have any forms here. Andy couldn't be here, but there are forms at the mail center. There's forms at the tavern that you can go online as well to not only get the form, but place your order. So please do that. It's another big fundraiser for us, and that's almost entirely for the Keep That Tree Beautiful initiative. So. Our community is beautiful. We want to make sure that we support that. And then the Sally Daw Stream Restoration Project has been scoped, and then, well, there's going to be some more information coming out from Dara on that. Again, that's something I can speak to that, uh, that well, but uh, it's about kind of keeping the erosion down and, you know, diverting some flow from uh, underneath the dam. Okay, and then we also, I'm gonna invite up Brian Vassar here, who is our lake and stream head, and he's gonna tell you about the quarterly macro and physical stream monitoring, as well as our monthly chemical stream monitoring. So Brian, if you wanna come up and let us know about what we did. We had a great turnout in October. <clears throat> we had ten people that uh, helped us work on the uh, stream monitoring. And what we do is we go out every month and take water samples, and. We check on nitrates, potassium, dissolved oxygen, phosphorus, and now we're doing turbidity and also suspended solids. So we're getting a lot of data and information that we put in every month to the Georgia Adopted Stream Program, which is where all this comes from. What we also did this quarter is macro, we call them macro invertebrates, which are those little tiny little critters that live in the water that survive only when there's good water and give you an indication of just how strong your water is and how good it is. These are macros if you've never seen them before. Megan came out to help us and got her first feel for them, and she loves them. <laughs> Actually, Kim and Dave are really the best at uh, doing that, and uh, they came out this month and helped us also. You'll see a variety of these, which are very, very small, from little water snakes. We have all kinds of different macro vertebrates that we use. And so these little crawfish, babies, different types of mayflies and critters. That, uh, we have a very good variety in, in, in the streams that are coming in. And uh, I guess if, if we want to look at this again, um, if you want to throw the next one up, Chris, and, and we'll take a look. Oh, I guess we'll back it down. You can back it down. There's only one. One more? OK. Um, over on Mulligan, big crayfish. This guy was about six inches long. Um, I was down there doing some turbidity readings, and uh, he came swimming up by my foot. Um, I couldn't find many macro invertebrates, little ones. I think he got them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, over, over on Coffee Creek, which you all know is back here and comes into the lake, uh, <coughs> lake levels are very low. Everything's 12 to 18 inches low. The lake is almost two feet low. Um, most of the streams and the soil around here are just because we're in a drought. Pretty simple. Uh, this culvert was discovered, and uh, we thought, oh boy, uh, this is a great place for runoff. And uh, because the water level is so low, we're finding things and seeing things. We found out that with the help of Dara and also Rick Patterson, that this is a, a culvert that goes across the road underneath, and it's a runoff um, exterior, external flow in case this floods again. And I don't know how many of you were around here when this thing flooded off the road and this all washed and the road washed and they tell me that the lake level was up almost the size of badminton net. So anyway, this is put in so that if this floods up high, it runs over just off of the 10th hole, down in, and then a separate route. So that's a, that's a backup for us. I'll just mention that in general, uh, the uh, water is very good. The nitrates are very low, 0.5 at the most. DO, seven, pH seven, eight. We're doing turbidity. And I will, I will mention something that's of concern and then uh, I'll get off this podium. The um, 
Mulligan Creek area is an area where there's a lot of runoff that comes down off the lake and off the golf course and, and, and goes out into the lake, which was one of the pictures that was there. Maybe you can back it up one more, Chris. This is, uh, this is the um, inlet off Mulligan down here. And you've been to many meetings and you've heard people come up and talk about, hey, my lakefront is gone. Well, the history, you know, the dredging, and they piled that all up. And now that the lake level is so low, this is the view from Randy's and other people that live there, and you're familiar with it. Um, and Mulligan comes in here, so now this is all above water. And um, so the inlet over here is basically good, though. Uh, Mulligan, we have a new turbidity meter that we use to measure the little dissolved solids that are in the water so we can see how much silt's coming in. And uh, we did that this time, and we found that off Mulligan, because of the work with the dams that are there to hold silt, that we got maybe a high reading coming off the culvert under Mulligan of like 2.2, which, which is not real high, but it's 2.2. It ponds, gets up to the next dam, settles, and goes over. It goes over the next dam, it drops to 1.2, so that's good. And as it goes down through the third little dam, silt dam that's there, it drops to like 1.2. By the time it got to our monitoring site, and down by the culvert, which some of you may know is over here where you can walk over onto this, um, it was zero. And uh, when it hits into the lake, there's a kind of a deep hole, about four feet deep. And there was a lot of fish in there, by the way, fingerlings, and uh, doing well. Uh, the silt was down to zero there also. Now, it's dry, we haven't had a major rain, and that could change, but uh, I just wanted to let you know, historically, and now with the data, that's where we're at. That's the stream monitoring. Many, many thanks to the 10 people that helped us. We had a record, record group of people that helped us do all this work this time. Total up the hours for Megan, 93 hours we put in. We did all that work last month. Thanks for leaving right as I got started, Mary Lou. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. So for everyone that knows me, which is probably like three people in the room, uh, my name is Chris Felt, and I work here at Benton Tree. My family and I moved here in November of 2018, and I've been working for Benton Tree since February of 2019. Um, Benton Tree is a beautiful place. I know you guys all know that. It's got amazing people, amazing volunteerism, and it really has an amazing uh, history. Um, and I had addressed a few of you before we got started here that in my mindset, lake and wildlife's role of conservation ties into what history is for me. And what's history if not but conserving the past, right? And it also ties into the role of the architectural coordinator where we, we work in tandem with the community and lake and wildlife and other parties to preserve our forests and stuff like that. So that's great. So getting started, I know some of you have to go soon, but, oh, okay, um, no problem. Um, we'll, we'll get there in a second. I just want to tell you that the beginning approach of this uh, presentation is I'm gonna walk you back in time as if you theoretically were an adult in 1972, some of you were, and you were living in, um, I was minus two. Uh, and, and you were living in the suburbs maybe of Atlanta or Atlanta proper and you picked up a copy of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and you started seeing these ads on this new place called Bentry. And I'm going to walk you through that process. What's it like learning about Bentry when it first came out, traveling up here up Highway 5, Highway 15, 515 wasn't here? Driving through Jasper then, getting to Bentry Drive, which was not Bentry Drive, it was Route 1. And going up to the front gate and learning about Bentry, I'm gonna, that's the first half of my speech. And you'll see that with pictures, which helps. Um, the rest of it is gonna be incidentals and things that I find interesting, that I hope that you also find interesting. So getting started, here we go. I found in this 1977 tour of homes guide that I have, an original, I brought it with me for those of you who might wanna see it after. This nice little poem. This was written by Ellen Troop, and she was instrumental back in the Tour of Homes thing, and she also happens to be the very first outdoor pool owner in Bentry history. 
um, on Starcross. Um, it's no longer there. I contacted the current owner. He's like, what do you mean I had a pool? <laughs> he was really bummed out. And I'm like, you know that concrete thing that's filled in behind your house on the left? He's like, uh, yeah, that was your pool. He's like, um, they never told me. And I'm like, you know, that may have been the selling point. Um, so <laughs> sometimes history uncovers little uh, tidbits like that, and it's a little awkward when you're the person like making the revelation. Unintended consequences pervade, right? So the poem, if you can read it, but maybe you can't, it says the quiet world. In the beginning, 1970, probably through 1978, the catchphrase instead of active mountain living was the quiet world of Bentry. And Mrs. Troop had written this poem about it. And sorry, I'm gonna read a poem to you. But it's really nice. Come away to the hills to a quiet place set apart. Share the sky with a hawk on the wing. Find the cool, silent answer to each restless heart. Hear the birds and the galaxies sing. The cares of the world seem to fall by the way and the spirit is boundless and free. Come to rest and enjoy, come to live, come to play in the quiet world setting, Bent Tree. So that's what she wrote back in 1977, and when I found it, I just thought I should share it with you guys. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the ad. We've moved the Bent Tree Mountains, right? So you can't really see it. Sorry, it's a little small. Um, what that represents is it's a diagram. It's an artist rendering of Bent Tree to include the front gate and the overlook and the golf course and that's all on there and it's kind of cute in the way that you might see like a little drawing of your hometown where you grew up. Someone did a little sketch and like oh there's the oil change place. Well this is what they did with Bent Tree in the beginning. Next slide please. At the very bottom of this ad, this was in the Pickens Progress, you'll see that it says come in and register located near the Bent Tree Welcome Center at Archer's Court. So Archer's Court, next slide please, is right there. Where is that? That's Walgreens. Back in 1972, that's Walgreens. And this was a little hotel, Greek restaurant, realty place, and Bentry Welcome Center. So they figured they would catch people on the corner of Highway 5 and Burnt Mountain Road, which makes sense, because 515 wasn't here. Next slide please. So they would pass out the literature here. Now, if you read this, it's really awkward because it says that we've got, you know, a marina, which wasn't here then. Okay, still not really here. Um, you know, clubhouse with an observation deck, which we don't have. That's not the Western deck. The original design, as you see in the artwork in the center, we were gonna have an observation tower. That got scrapped. That was phase three. We only ever went through phase two. So it had a lot of promises, and this was later used against us, or at least the developer, when we won a lawsuit and we became Bent Tree as ourselves, because um, they didn't fulfill most of the promises they made in the beginning. Next slide. Um, that's just a little blurb about why it's awesome to live here. Next slide. This is a, re a rendering also. Now, if you look closely, it's really weird. You see people fishing on Hendricks Mountain. Okay, not possible. Also, there's archery, okay? So we originally had set up for archery and trap shooting. We originally had set up for a hunting preserve. I can't imagine where that would be, but I would think nowhere, <laughs> unless by archery. <laughs> Next slide, please. So when you got to the corner after you left the Welcome Center at Archer's Court, this is at the corner of Cove and Tate Mountain Road at the time, now Burton Mountain Road. This is where the Shell Station is now. Main gate. 3.8 miles, go that way. Next slide. There's our original sign at the corner of Route 1 in Cove Road, now Bentry Drive. And there's our original gate. You notice the angular kind of rustic feel to it? Most of Bentry had split rail fencing, wood, and angles. This was our original concept. You see that, at least in the original photos of Club Tamarack, the front gate entrance, and everywhere else. Next slide, please. So, they had an open house, and we had two places where we welcomed people. One, the Welcome Center, originally in Bentry property, was where, kind of where our old trash center was just a few years ago. It's a weird place for it, but there was a Welcome Center back just to the right by the cottage. And the picture on the right there is they had ponies here. 
and horses because they didn't have a stables. And they needed a way to distract the children so the parents could run off in the 4x4 Jeeps on our gravel roads, not paved roads, and drive around and make important decisions about things they were going to buy. So the picture here I got from a resident that lived here in 1972. He was about six then. I tracked him down through a photo. He's about 54 now. And he was like, you know, how did you find me? <laughs> and why was this important to you? But had I not found him, I wouldn't have a lot of these original photographs that I get to share with you guys now, right? So that's important. Next slide. So that is a little map on the left from the 1977 tour of homes. Hard to see, but what you'll notice, and I can email this presentation to anybody that wants it, is our original admin office was where our mail center was. And it was a trailer. And our original sales office, which we don't have anymore, was like one of those octagonal buildings, which is in the house where, right behind the mail center is today at that location. It's not there anymore, but that's where it was. So houses on this map, one, two, and three, and four, three of those I was able to locate through public records and they're still the same. One of those four houses was no longer here and a, a site was rebuilt over it. Next slide, that's our sales team. These are the guys that made you excited about Bentry, I guess. And if you look at the picture behind them, you can kind of see the angular shape of the sales building. That's the only reason I included this photo. Next slide. So this is the artist architectural rendering of Bentry. And this used to be in the pro shop, but um, there are copies available for purchase now. But you, we have a marina right near Peter Kilpo's house. Sorry, Peter, we didn't put it there. Um, and we have the stables on Hendricks Mountain in this photo. I don't know what it is with Hendricks Mountain and trout and the horses, but <laughs> neither of those things seem tenable at 2,700 feet. <laughs> this was a concept I didn't have it that's there. So next slide. This is our conceptual drawing of the pro shop from the back, from the golf course. They showed people these conceptual drawings when they came to the octagonal building. Next slide. There's our pool rendering. For those of you that don't know, that is an Olympic sized pool, the upper pool. And it sh doesn't show it here, but we had um, a pretty high diving board. We had lifeguards. The building behind it is the teen center. And that's still the teen center, but no one calls it that. It used to have a jukebox and ping pong tables and food. It still has a ping pong table. Next slide. There's a bigger drawing with the rendering um, with the observation tower. I think at that height, even today, you'd be like, oh, look at the tops of those trees. Um, before we did the vista pruning, that is. But we never built that. Next slide. This is that kid again that I tracked down. This is how I tracked him down. <laughs> I saw a black and white version of this photo in a 1972 Echo. It went by his nickname. So I had a nickname to track him down with. It said Rocky. Six-year-old Rocky enjoys the Hendricks Mountain Overlook. I'm like, yay me. This is the color photo I got from him. So what you're looking at here is from 212 High Trail Vista today. And there used to be a big bridge and it went out and from that vantage point, you're looking west, northwest at Sharp Top and Jasper, the lake and the golf course. Mind you, in 1972, not everything was finished. The back nine wasn't done. Club Tamarack wasn't done. But you still got the idea of what the neighborhood would look like, and that's why they put that there. Next slide. This is that view taken from an aerial shot in 1986. Next slide. This is the water tank on the top of Big Stump Mountain. It's still there, but there's a lot of trees behind it. The guy climbing it is our golf pro, <laughs> Joe Van Sant. Now, I'm not sure why he's climbing it. Maybe it's a photo op. Um, doesn't seem practical to me. Uh, the picture on the right is a hidden, for real, water tank up on Big Stump Mountain. Still in operation. Back down the mountain on the terrain you wouldn't want to hike to. Ties into a natural spring and has a bunch of pipes going out of it. Still there. It's massive. It's really, no one in the water department knows why it's there. Obviously it was for pressure, but they forgot about it over the 52 years that we've been here. Next slide, oh, okay, perfect. Tennis, 
So here we are looking at tennis and the tennis and the teen center from 1972. Next page. Club Tamarack. So you'll notice the split rail fence inside, and there's no steps coming off the side. So originally, you know, you had to just stay up top or go outside to get outside. Um, that's the dining room. I don't really like the curtains, I'm going to be honest. Um, I'm not a big fan of plush and red and things, but that's what it looks like. I think it looks better today, just being honest. Next, there's our pool. This was the adult pool. I know there's contention over that. But this was designated as the adult pool when Ventry opened. And there were no lifeguards at the adult pool. I guess they figured you could, you know, make it. <laughs> this is the teen center right as it was constructed. And this is another, a different golf pro's wife. So this is Mrs. McAfee sitting on something, posing by the teen center. So there's food being served back in the day with a little cute little cute coach sign there. And uh, you see the diving board, the higher one that we don't have anymore. And you see the lifeguard stands. Um, it turns out that over time, lifeguards became a liability and so did diving boards. So we took the fun stuff away so people could be safe. There's another picture of our Mickey Mouse Clover Pool from that angle. Um, it is, again, it looks different if you look at the decking and the angles along the front of the photo. And that's where we visited the room, so there's a lot more trees there in 1972 than there was, or 74 than today. Next slide. This is Tavern at the 19th Hole. Being constructed, it was not called the Tavern at the 19th Hole. It was called the Little Club, for real. <laughs> and Club Tamarack was called the Main Club. <laughs> Until 1992, Everyone that was here, that's what those places were referred to. Next slide, please. This is opening day at our golf course on the front nine. And there was a lot of people in attendance that day. Next slide. These are original par signs for those of you that golf. Pretty rustic, um, kind of awkward. Um, there on the right is the seventh hole, um, minus the bed tree emblem that we have landscaped there now. Um, it's still really a pretty course. Next slide. Can't see the photo, not my fault. Dam completed at Bent Tree. Um, dam completed in 1972, lake filled up six months later. And the picture on the right is our paddle, our paddle boat dock that we had. And this was off the left side, now near Goose Island. Um, we had those, I don't know why it went away. I'm presuming with some of the heavy rains that we got over the storms over the years that it kind of blew away. And they said, you know, we don't need to build that, and we don't want to have paddle boats for everybody. So they got rid of those two. Next. No, but yeah, there's a lifeguard stand. Notice on the beach. No swim at your own risk, then. This is the stables construction. This is a little bit later. This is 1973. This is the back of the stables, for those of you that are wondering why it looks so weird. That room that juts off there, that's the current feed room. And that's the outside of the barn back in the day when they painted it red and had horses on it. And again, traditional split rail fencing, but they were white. And that's the inside of the stables. It's pretty similar today. There's our tennis center right after they enclosed it in 1976. So it used to just be four outdoor courts, but they enclosed two of them in 1976. And they built that little small building, which is way different than the one they have today. Next. Here's the home tour guide again. Um, I have that with me if anyone wants to look through it, and that's just a description of the different houses as you come and how to do things. Next slide. There's the pool. This is the pool on Star Cross. This is the picture that I sent to the guy. He's like, I had that. That's my house. Yeah. They called it the Heimlich House, which is not a name I would call. <laughs> this may have been before the maneuver was made so popular. <laughs> Unless there's something I'm unaware of and the parties were rough. Um, they did have a cabana. The photo mentions a cabana. Um, I would have called it, you know, you know, like the Herzhaus and there's something else in German, but Heimlich, you know, this is not a good sound to it. So here's our villas, 1976-1977. Live like a king on a mountain for 39500 That was the purchase price of a villa in 76, and that's the original villa sign as you would drive down where our current one is today. 
Okay, now this is where it starts to get interesting. I'm going to come over here and point. <clears throat> okay, what are we looking at here? This is where our dam is. This is where Lake Tamarack is. This is where the stables is. Still is, yeah. The engineering house is still there. That's the only house there off the left across from Hummingbird that goes down into the valley. Sally Smith lives there. Um, that was the engineering house. They did all of the design of the lake, the golf course, everything from that location. The quarry and the quarry lake right here. You see it was all forest. Hummingbird Lane, so the original road through Breed Bent Tree, over Hummingbird Lane, down under the lake, connecting up the hill to Long Swamp Drive across the spillway, Long Swamp Court, under the lake. Padsit Court. Over here would be Rainbow Court and the other streets on this side. Next slide. Now, even more arrows. Okay, so this is after they took down all the forest. You see the quarry starting to form here. They didn't hit the spring that made the lake yet. This little dot is the rock crusher. This is where they made all our roads. They quarried all of that out and made our 55 miles of roads from the rock crusher from that site. Um, real quick, Tamarack Point, Rainbow Court, Blue Surf, Spiltway. There's the engineering house that's still there. And our other streets. This is before, there's only 33 Tamarack Point. This is where Michelle Schaefer lives today. 221 Lakeview, that's where Dennis Baggett lives today. And 3316 Tamarack. All these houses are still in Bentry today. Next slide. This is just a current picture of the same area. Well, not current, but 1984. Next slide. That's a current picture. So the house for the engineer was converted. It was abandoned after they built Bentry. And in 1978, a Jasper resident bought it and the foundation was rotted in a way, the windows were broken. The linoleum business floor was still there. And he converted it and he put carpet in and redid the whole thing. Next slide. So there it is on the left in 1978 after it was converted. And there it is today on the right. So same house, the siding looks different, the decks are a little different, but that's the house where all the plans for Ventry were implemented. This is Bent Tree Drive, Route 1, and the little building, if you can see it off on your left right there, yep, thank you, that's where Apple Valley Farm had a little produce shop, 1983, and that's now the site of the Presbyterian Church. Bent Tree sold that land in 1982 to the church, and so we gave up acreage there for that, but that's where the little Apple Valley Farm used to be, the stand, the fruit stand. Our host house, aka the bus stop, AKA the animal shelter, AKA the country store, and also admin at one time, is our current bus stop, almost. Right behind the fire station, right to the left of the waste and recycling center, still there, but it was $10 a night. You would come up here, and starting in 1986, you could stay for $10 a night. There were three rooms. They each had a TV and an air conditioner, and that's it. If you go in the building, there's one of the rooms that still looks like it. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, but you know, it's there. Um, next slide. Club Tamarack gets a new name. I'm not sure who thought that Club Tamarack would be a creative name after Lake Tamarack was made when we have no Tamarack trees in Bentry. In my opinion, it's just, it's a little weird, um, but that's the one that won, just like Bentry Drive was won as a contest also. That was a real creative name too. <laughs> This is our public safety building, new version, built in 1994. That's what it looked like then. There's a little bit of a glare on the photo, but that's what it looked like. Next slide. That's our admin building, built in 1994. This is the current building that we're in. That's our mail center, built in 1998. Some of our workers are still there. There's um, Junior, Tim Carver. Ricky Kirk is no longer with us, but I mean, in that tree, he's still alive. Um, next slide. Okay, there's a spillway, 1995 with no bridge, no spillway bridge in 95. It came in, in like around 1998. 
And there's an aerial shot showing the bridge in 1999, right to the right of the road. It's hard to see, but that's where it was. Okay, talking about the spillway bridge, this is important because part of the spillway bridge was built from the old overlook that I showed you with six-year-old rocky plant on it. They used the wood left over from that to build the original spillway bridge. And that was fine until Hurricane Ivan blew away the spillway bridge in 2004. No one knows where that piece of wood is today. It's gone. Speaking of Mr. Lewis, the guy that built that, this was the house that he lived in right to the right of where 212 High Trail Vista is. That house is still there today. Robin Dunn lives there. Um, that's where Mr. Lewis lives. It was one of the first five houses built in Ventry. Next slide. That's Robin Dunn's house today, 198 High Trail Vista. This is the conceptual sketch of the Memorial Garden. This is what the plan came out in the echo when we told everybody what we were going to do. Next slide. That's the building of it on the left, and that is the opening officiating ceremony of the Memorial Garden, 2002. This is the new version of the front of the tennis center, 2006, 2007. And now that's kind of like our buildings and changes and all that stuff. This is going back to the start. Dean Spratlin there on the right is a developer. Dean Spratlin happens to be the guy that, some of you already know this, I told this to some of you, he's the guy that saved George Bush. Senior, when he crashed into the ocean, he was a submarine commander, Spratlin was, and they picked him up and they saved him. They became lifelong friends as a result of it. But that's the guy that built that tree. Next slide. So his original plan, as we talked about, um, Ventry, before it was going to be Ventry, was going to be hound ears. I'm not making it up. Ask yourself why, then look at a map. And you'll say, oh, I get it. It's dumb, but I get it. Our golf course looks like hound ears. That was one of the original names. I'm glad they didn't pick that. Beach Mountain, also kind of a bad name, better than hound ears. Not much better, but Ventry is, is much better than both of those. Also, oh, that's fine. Um, right here on this slide, he talks about having 10,000 acres, another promise that never came through. We got 3,500. And he talks about, you know, when our shopping area is going to be here, never materialized. And a whole bunch of other things that really just never came to fruition. But this, again, was used in the lawsuit when Ventry took over from the developer. Next slide. Here's our original area sketch. So you notice there's a new one. We have the Shadowick Ridge, which is not a section today. It was conceptualized and never put into place. I don't know why, but maybe because there's like four homes. But yeah, it never happened. But the rest of the sections are accurate. Next slide. Now this is where we get into the part that I think is fun, where most of you might be like, what are you doing? OK, the map on the right, 1832. This is Cherokee County and then later Gilmer County. This is 20 years before Pickens County. And right here, right here, see the CHs? Chestnut trees. That's Chestnut Cove. The original maps showed all the tree species that were here. And Chestnut Cove is known for the chestnut trees that was here on the original maps going back as far as 1832. Um, the map on the left is for the land lottery enumeration map that they pulled from the same map. That's when all of the Europeans were awarded land here. Next slide. So these are some maps. I'm going to bring these with you. This is a 1929 topographical map of our area. This right here says Chestnut Cove. That was a zone. Hendricks Mountain, also known. Moss Patch, for those of you that may live near Moss Patch. Big stump. We got Denny Ridge, Fields House across from Mr. McCabe's house on Crippled Oak. And, and then we've got other areas. We've got Little Pine Mountain. That's where we're all standing right now. So Little Pine Mountain Road is named after where we're at. Next slide. OK, so Buck Skull Spring. This is where Ventry gets all of its water, most of it down the Chestnut Cove Trail, Wildcat, Mole Mountain, Long Swamp Creek, Little Pine Mountain again, 
Coffee Cove with a Y. Thank you. Next slide. We got Bee Tree Ridge and Horse Cove Creek, which actually is not inside of here. And then we got Sharp Top Mountain. So my point being is most of our sections, most of our street names, lots of incidentals all came from the early maps. Next slide. And now getting into lake and wildlife material. Bentry was the first development in Georgia to have a paid onboard conservationist. And so Dr. Greer here, who's really famous in conservation circles in Bentry for years and years and years and outside of Bentry, he built the nature trail across from Mr. McCabe's house, again, across from the water plant. Um, he also helped determine what species would be beneficial for erosion control, things like that. Next slide. Nature Trail moves to scenic location, so I can't find the original location of the Nature Trail. So I don't know where it moved from, but it moved to across from the water plant. And these are just two articles in the Echo about that. Next slide. The Nature Trail on this map, right here. It's Bella Vista, Coffee Cove, water plant, Nature Trail. So when I first moved here, this is one of the first things I tracked down. Next slide. See that placard there? That's still in the woods. There's a couple of them. All the species of plants and trees were enumerated out there. And they're all throughout the woods across from the water department, if you look closely enough. Those were all set up by Dr. Greer. He brought in his students from Shorter College, and they all instituted the plan, and they're still all there. Now, none of the words are on them. All the species are worn off, but the placards are still there. And then Dr. Greer participated in the archaeological digs that happened here. And they found a bunch of artifacts across 50 different dig sites in Bentry. It was uh, Robert Blakely and Roy Dickens and Dr. Greer. Right there on the picture on the left from the echo is a quartz arrowhead that they found here. And the picture on the right is one that I have from the ninth hole, just off the ninth hole. They never found any pottery in Bentry. They did find hunting implements. And so the assessments of the original archaeological reports is Indians didn't live here, but they hunted here, and they hunted the ridge lines for big game. There's no real fertile valleys in Bentry, and there's no real flat places in Bentry traditionally. So most of the local Cherokee Indians lived when you drive to Jasper through the S-curves, right there, right at the bottom of the S-curves in that field in places similar to that throughout the county, but not here. That's Roy Dickens. This is the Bentry artifacts, by the way. He's looking through them. You can't really tell what they are right here, but I tracked down the university. I went to the Department of Anthropology and the Department of Archaeology. They're like, hey, we know who he is. We have a department named after him. Oh, we don't know about the Bentry collection, though. So it's lost. I tried to get it for the speech. They can't find it, and the state record of archaeology has no record of it. So it was a college thing, college project that just never got cataloged, right, and got lost or went to his home collection. Next slide, right here. Um, this is a helicopter putting out a fire with water from the, what they called in the picture Bentry Lake. They didn't know it was Lake Tamarack. This is 1978. That's a little late not to know it's called Lake Tamarack. Well, it's listed as Bentry Lake, but the helicopter from, came down and took the water and put out the 800 acres that were on fire by arsonists on Sharp Top. Not inside of Bentry, just outside of it, but they took water from our lake to help, so that's, that's a good lake and wildlife thing, right? Air crash, Bentry, this is from the Echo, 1988. Small plane, one person crashed into Mount Oldthorpe. And Bentry and the residents were instrumental in helping recover in identifying the crash scene. Now the article in the Echo makes no mention of the person's name and because it was listed on April 1st, I first <laughs> thought maybe someone was pulling a prank on us from the Echo. Um, but I was able to track down the name of the gentleman and it, it really did happen. He did pass away. Um, in the moment of irony, his last name was Spikes. Um, but that's a personal joke for me, I guess. Um, <laughs> 
This is the very first letter that came out to Bentry residents in 1970. I uh, took away the name that was on the envelope. It's dated June of 1970. Basically, it welcomes you to Bentry. It talks about the contest to name Bentry Drive. And if you win, you win a cassette player. <laughs> and they suggested Bentry Drive in the article. <laughs> and that one. So I don't know that anyone got the cassette player. <laughs> the next slide. This is our original architectural report uh, standards. So back in 1970, it said you had to have a site plan, a floor plan. You had to have approved colors. No less than 900 square feet of enclosed weather tight floor space. It went up on the golf course. It was 1,000 on the golf course and 1,200. So it's a lot different, but it said you had to have a sink and a stove <laughs> and power. Okay, so anyway, our standards have improved over time, I think. I'd like to think so. So these are some artifacts and memorabilia. I brought these with me. That is a golf divot tool from 1972. I found that on eBay from a guy that thought it was from Bentry, California. That's the company that made it, but there is no Bentry, California, so I'm like, yeah, I'll take it for 10 bucks. On the right is a gold inlaid ashtray with the pars of different golf holes that I got out of a house from a friend. Thank you, he's in the audience. Um, it was left over from the original owner and I don't smoke, so it's kind of, you know, and I don't golf, so I know it's horrible that I have this and I own it, but I'm not breaking it and I'm not ruining it with stuff either. That is a bent tree nightlight. It still works, by the way. And it says the quiet world, right? Like the thing, come in full circle and there's bent tree matchbooks. That's right, I got those too. Thank you, eBay. Bent tree country club. So there was a period of time, 1977, where Bent Tree's ownership, right before the developer went away, was handled by the Country Clubs of America. And there was reciprocal arrangements around the country, but when we were the Bent Tree Country Club, they gave us those patches. And I have one of those patches. The thing on the right, I apologize that my fridge is not more clean on the outside. That is a giant magnet. And I think people used to drive around with those on their vehicles. But I have it on my fridge because I'm not gonna put that magnet on my car. <laughs> Next, okay, now we're getting into the fun stuff. So this is the site of an 1800s moonshine rock furnace that I found. This is in Bentry, it's on Bentry property. That's a map and how to get there. So basically, if you come through Crippled Oak from the beach side and you pass Camelot Way and you come up to the wooden split rail fence on your left at the start of the adjacent property, and you hike into the woods, you will find the moonshine still at that circle. <laughs> the circle won't be there when you get there, so you have, to, you have to look around. But on the right is the moonshine still, and lower right is iron bars that are still there that was used to go under it to keep it you know, working. That was an ephemeral stream. I assume at one time there was more water because kind of weird to build the moonshine still with no water in the middle of a forest with no roads. Okay, next slide. That is an ice waterfall that we have in Bentry. This is by Chestnut Cove Trail. This is by my house. This happens when ice is over and we have a big onset storm that starts as rain. If it starts at rain and converts to ice overnight because it freezes suddenly, what you see on the right happens. You see the height of the guy in the photo. That's an eight to 10 foot fall of ice. That happens maybe once or twice a year. So if it happens and you guys feel dangerous enough to come out and explore, I live there, so I'm okay, but you might not want to drive up and check it out, but I'd be happy to show you to it. This over here, this is a cliff that I recently found, but Rick Patterson beat me to it. He knew about it already because he happens to live on the street. But I found this in a map on a website from a guy that used to live here who archived his whole life, and so, you know, I tracked it down and followed him out. That's the view on the right. This is from Buck's Gold Court. It's really pretty, but it's right above a bunch of bear dens, so if you go, go with friends, and go with a slow friend. <laughs> right. If you don't have a slow friend, bring a pocket knife. Just kidding. All right, so, next slide. 
Just kidding. Next slide. Um, remember Professor Greer, our conservationist. His wife, Mildred, was a, a poet and a conservationist. She just died last year at the age of 101. And this is really what I think about Bentry because, you know, we all talk about, oh, this and that and Bentry, but really, you know, it's our natural environment that draws us to this place, I think. And long after bentry has gone, which hopefully is a thousand years from now, our mountains are still going to be here. And so that's the nature of this poem. Oh, it's true, some have come to change what they can, but the mountains in time will say no to man. In vain they move boulders, in vain alter streams. They never will ever learn how to pave dreams. For your words bear them witness as time passes by, and the mountain tops still define the whole sky. The mountaintops still define the whole sky. And that came from uh, Dr. Greer's wife, Mildred, who again just passed last year. That's the end of my presentation, but I've got a whole bunch of personal artifacts and trinkets and memorabilia up here if you guys want to see it. And if you guys want to ask me a couple of questions, up to you. Any questions? But I hope you learned something. I hope uh, you, some of it was new to you. I appreciate you all coming out. You have a question? Yeah. So is Peach Mountain why they named my street Blue Surf? Um, I, I think it's related to the lake more than the mountain. Where's the surf? <laughs> uh, well, we don't have enough tides for there to be a surf absent certain storms. So um, I've seen them at the dam. Because you live there and you make waves. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, any, any other questions? Oh, one in the back. What's your take on a bent tree? The Indian story is a bent tree. Okay, so I've got, this, I've got the photo of it on my phone. It's not in the slideshow. Yeah. It's not true. Dean Spratlin was driving through Florida, like near Puerto Vallarta. He had had his receptionist with him. He passed a community called lost tree and he said oh a lost tree i like that let's call it bent tree that's the whole story from the developer himself that's chronicle that's in the newspapers it's in interviews he didn't name it after bent trees he didn't name it after indians and he thought it was cute and it was reminded of lost tree lost tree by the way is a development and is still around so you can google it their logo is not too different than ours do, so it's kind of neat. That's that's the story from the developer. What about the marked trees that are the bent trees? You mean the, the placards that we have? Yeah. There are people that live here, and there are people that live around that say, "Hey, it made sense for Indians to bend trees for various purposes." A lot of times, in snowy areas, you would bend a tree because it would be four or five feet up, and then you could put stuff on top of it that would stick out in the snow as a marker. We don't get snow like that here. So if bench trees are used to indicate water sources, that would be kind of weird, considering that we've got one stream, the big one that runs through here. I, don't, I wouldn't need a tree to find a stream. And if you're blind, you can hear it, and you're not gonna see the tree, so I don't know <laughs> what the logic behind it. Listen, it's a charming story and it's wonderful folklore and it's cute. And I get it, I get it, it's magical. I don't think it's probable, apart from the fact that 90% of our trees were harvested in the 18s and 1900s, right? And then if you look at the trees that we see today, when you look at the size of them, a tree today that the Indians would have to have bent, assuming they were one years old when they bent it, would have to be around 270 years old. Okay, so 300-year-old trees in bent tree? Yeah, there's a couple. Are they bent? Not usually. Yeah. I don't think it's practical, but that's my opinion. So you asked the question. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, well, thanks for coming out, everybody. Thank you.